Thank you, Marie Alix. Good evening. I would like to I have the great pleasure to introduce Luc Pogam. Luc is an associate professor at the well known French business school, HEC Paris. He holds a PhD in financial accounting after a Master of Finance from Paris Dauphin University. Luc is not only a CFA shareholder, but also an active member of our advocacy committee. Uh, in this academic paper, Luc and the other contributors found that short sellers are more likely to provide target prices when the targets are less complex to value, when the price are expected to decline more, and when the short sellers are more reputable. Can we consider that short sellers can be informative and manipulative at the same time? This is a very interesting debate, and I hope that Luc will help us to understand these very crucial issues. Luc, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Bernard, for this uh, nice introduction. Thank you also, Maria Lix. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks also to uh, CFA Society France for uh, giving me this opportunity to present this uh, academic paper on uh, pessimistic target prices by uh, uh, short sellers. Uh, this is a collaborative effort um, with my uh, PhD, um, my uh, one of my colleague at HEC, uh, Alexandre Madeleine, uh, who I supervise for his PhD studies, with also Hervé Stolovy from uh, HEC Paris, my colleague, and uh, with uh, Wu Yang Zhao from UT Austin in, uh, in uh, Texas. So thank you all for attending. Um, so maybe before we start, we can start with a, a little survey about whether you know or you don't know necessarily um, who are those uh, so-called activist uh, short sellers. So if you could quickly uh, answer that, that survey, that would be very appreciated. Let's give it uh, uh, a little bit of time. Okay. Okay, so uh, a fair majority of you know, um, know who uh, those activist short sellers are, so, but but there's a still a, a sort of a significant percentage that don't necessarily know ent entirely. So at any rate, uh, I, I, I will to, to make sure that you, you're quite familiar with the topic and we know uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video. So I'm going to uh, switch to uh, YouTube and show you this, uh, this video of this famous activist short seller called Cytron Research and uh, the, the sort of manager, directing manager of Cyton Research is called uh, Andrew Leff and he's, he appears on CNBC in this video. And he talks about a, a company he's uh, attacking, he's shorting. You got your face ripped off for a little bit. Uh, yeah, I had a bad 48 hours. I think I, I have no problem saying this. I probably lost more money on Tilray than I think they've, they've spent on R&D since inception. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, really, or, or I mean, maybe lost more than the revenues for the quarter, but all that's, you know, that's yesterday, it's in the rearview mirror. Uh, well, why are you still short? This, you know, like I said with Tesla, if the premise changes, you, you go. Tilray went public six months ago at $18 a share, 18. It's only gotten worse, the landscape of it. Where's it now? $103 a share. That's a joke. I mean, it, it's, it, this is not a stock. It is a, it's an instrument. It's not a company. What's unfortunate is that it's getting this much airtime. Because when you take companies like Tesla, all the companies we've discussed in the past, Apple, the, today, these are companies, okay? Tilray, it, it's a stock operation. Let's keep a low flow. We'll put it out there. Retail investors won't know what goes higher. Hit CNBC. For a while, they had a little side box on the, on the side uh, as if the company like cured cancer or something. And we, where did the stock price go the day it went higher? It's a tight flowed stock. When the stock comes up, and, it, and the float opens up, it'll go lower. They're, they just put out their quarter. You, uh, you don't even want to read it. You would really just walk off no, and just I, gag I yourself. Look at it. I know these stocks, and I, I have two questions. No, for this you. is a word. You can know these. This particular one I, I, is I don't the worst. I your premise around the float, but the issue around this industry. So I'm going to stop there because the rest is, uh, is sort of, of similar, uh, similar wording. So, um, so one thing I want to insist about this particular firm. So the firm that the short seller attacks is called Tilray, 
and it markets itself as a global leader in cannabis research. So you can highlight the term uh, research. And basically, the, the firm is uh, trying to, um, to make the argument that they are trying to anyway do research on cannabis and, and those sort of things. And, and you can see the, the language that is used by Cyclone Research and uh, Andrew Left um, is very aggressive in a way. So that's typical of activist short sellers. So they, they will attack firms very aggressively. And in that case, they claim that the firm has little revenue, uh, that it's a joke, that it's not really a stock, that it's a, it has very uh, lit, uh, little amount of float, that it's only for retail investors, it's a stock operation, things like that. And you can see so that that, that interview was made uh, on CNBC around that time, as you can see the, the vertical red line, and basically you can see zero is there. So after that, basically the, the, the stock went after the IPO went back to something similar, close to, uh, close to, to zero. All right, so what do activist short sellers, uh, what, what are their operations, what, what do they do? Basically, activist short selling consists of buying shares from a broker, selling shares immediately, so that's typically what a short seller would do, but the activist part comes in step three when they disseminate rationale for shopping the stock to other investors. So what they would typically do is uh, issuing a very negative and aggressive report about the target firm, the attacked firm, um, and to try to convince other investors, um, they try to convince other investors that basically the stock is overvalued, that it's a fraud, that is very aggressive, that it's, you know, it's a flawed business model, etc. Uh, and then the, the rest, uh, the two next steps are basically the same as in a regular short seller. So you buy back the share and you return them to a broker and you hope that you buy back at a price that is lower than the price at which you sold in step two. Okay. So that is the, the business model of activity short seller. So those are hedge fund, um, uh, hedge fund typically. And they do that either with their own money or with uh, what they call a balance sheet partner, another hedge fund, for instance, that can uh, provide more funds to do that activity. And with that other uh, hedge fund, sometimes they share the information. Okay, so it's a very frequent and global phenomenon right now, uh, especially after the global financial crisis. So there are a number of uh, uh, famous cases that happened since uh, 2009. So Cytron Research is sort of the oldest, the grandpa of the activist short seller since it was created in 2001. But you do have other uh, activist short sellers organizations such as Gotham City Research, who, uh, for instance, targeted a, a firm called Let's Go X in 2014. So the firm was indeed a fraud, a, a large fraud, and uh, the, the, the firm went uh, bankrupt, as, I believe, three days after Gotham City attacked um, that particular firm. Then you have other research uh, activist hedge fund, activist short seller, Copperfield Research, Glocus Research, uh, Iceberg Research was founded by the way by, the for, by a former uh, HEC alumni, uh, by an HEC alumni, uh, Muddy Waters that we know very well in, in, in France because they, they attacked uh, Rally Casino in 2015. And uh, more recently, uh, Indenberg Research attacked a, a firm that, um, that produced new uh, engines for, uh, for vehicles um, called Nicola in 2020. All right, so you can see already with the names of those organizations that there's some, some sort of special, right? Gotham City is directly inspired by Batman, Copperfield Research by uh, David Copperfield Magic, uh, Iceberg Research by the fact that some, some big part of reality is actually under the water reality, under the water and hidden. And um, I believe Hindenburg Research relates to the big, uh, uh, the big accident uh, of the um, aeroplanes that crashed uh, during, um, shortly around the Second World War. Um, all right, so uh, the key question sort of that was uh, uh, asked by, uh, by Bernard and are short sellers good or bad for financial markets, for society in itself? Um, because to some extent, they are very criticized. For instance, uh, company, or people representing companies typically accuse them of spreading false rumors to negatively impact stock prices. Okay, uh, some people argue that short sellers can exacerbate financial prices and firm specific difficulty. We remember that, for instance, uh, for the um, for the recent scandal in Germany, 
uh, the, the wire card, for the wire card scandal, sorry, uh, the Baffin banned uh, short selling for the, for the, for the stocks of, um, of wire card. Okay. Um, so there are, there are some temporary short selling restrictions and including during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, we saw, and um, it's, it, it, I believe it, it's still, uh, going on, we saw some short selling bans in some countries. All right. So that's the sort of the, the industry uh, uh, information that we have about activist short sellers, at least short sellers. And on the other side, about acad what academic re research has shown about short sellers, actually that they provide some, some interesting things to financial markets. For instance, they are able to identify underperforming firms. Um, that means that in advance, they can sort of identify which firms are overvalued and which firms are not overvalued. So they, they can predict future stock returns, as we saw with Tilray, for instance. Um, they are also uh, better at doing this than financial analysts and corporate insiders. So they, 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 are, they are sophisticated players that can sort, sort of uh, anticipate some events or uh, have superior ability to conduct financial analysis. And so uh, the academic literature shows that to some extent they contribute to price discovery. So they make to some extent fundamental prices, uh, pr stock prices converge to fundamental value and they increase uh, market efficiency. Right, there are a number of studies also showing this. Okay. So um, the idea is that it, it, it's, it's sort of reconciliation that needs to be made, and that's what we try to do in this paper. Because uh, we know that they're good at identifying overvalued stocks. But to date, right now, there's no evidence about whether the accuracy at predicting overvaluation is actually correct. And we don't know how, how accurate they are to predict the extent of overvalu overvaluation. And that particular research papers examines precisely this question, in particular, whether short sellers, uh, their target prices that they sometimes communicate in their report, um, they are able to sort of identify correctly overvaluation. And to do this, we rely on a data set of, uh, from a, a provider called Activist Insights uh, that provide a lot of data on uh, activist investing, not only uh, activist short selling, but also uh, activist hedge fund, long investors. And we collect 1,237 short selling attacks between 2010 and 2018. Okay? And among those 1,237 short selling attacks, 637 have a target price. So in 637 attacks, the short seller, the activist short sellers, uh, is uh, precise is uh, accurate and says, okay, well, uh, the, the, the correct valuation for that firm is, um, say, 20, uh, 20 euros. And so the implied uh, downside return should be, for instance, minus 40%. All right. So to make sure that we know what we are talking about, uh, here you, saw, you see an example of uh, an activist short seller report. Uh, so it's from Muddy Waters Research, and it targets a firm called uh, American Tower Corp, okay, um, and and the, basically the firm has a market cap of uh, around half a billion US dollars, and uh, they claim that the firm is overvalued, of course, and one of the arguments is that their headquarters is located next to that uh, that wall, and you don't you probably can see it, but there there are some uh, bullet holes in the wall, so they say, well, how can you trust that organization, that firm, knowing that their uh, headquarter is uh, in a bad neighborhood in, uh, in, in Brazil, right? And, and most importantly, um, what you see there is the target price of, uh, from the, the activist short seller. It says basically the, the current stock price is 74.71. We estimate that it's really worth $44.57, okay? So that's one example. Another one, if I can uh, change the slide, yes, another one is um, Gotham City Research report on Let's Go X, so the, the fraud. And, and here the, the, the actual target price is simply zero uh, euro per share because they claim that it's a fraud, uh, a fraud, so they claim that it's going to be delisted, it's, it's going to go bankrupt, so it has really no market value. 
And one of their big arguments is that um, let's go X add audit fees. If you scale audit fees by uh, the percentage of revenues, the, 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 the amount paid as audit fees are ridiculous. They are very low compared to uh, comparable firms, peer firms. Okay, and they claim that basically it's a fraud. Um, there are a number of things that don't add up, and they were correct um, in in their report. And you can see in terms of uh, you know the, the, the sort of narrative, the sort of images they they communicate. You know they they make fun of the logo of the company. They they try to to play on word uh, with the title of the report. Et you see the, the sort of aggressivity in the in the language and in the the joke they can make about firms. All right. So what do I, what are the questions? Uh, that we address in the paper. We address essentially four questions. The first is, what are the relations between future returns and the disclosure and level of target prices? So here we try to say, okay, well, they, they issue a target price. Is it able to predict future returns? Okay, and that's important because if those guys can predict future returns, maybe we should pay more attention to um, their target prices, right? It, it's, it's really important to to understand whether they, they are able to predict future returns. Uh, the second question we address is whether, why do they do that in some cases and they don't in other cases? So what can we say about, uh, for instance, let's say that we have a, a firm that is attacked by an activist short seller. Let's say Solution 30 is attacked by an activist short seller. Um, well, in that case, is there an act, a, a target price provided? If not, is it a good news or a bad news? Um, if we take on average the other cases with target and without target prices, okay? Question number three, uh, we try to estimate whether those target prices are biased or not, all right? Uh, we try to see whether, uh, to what extent do activist short sellers exaggerate the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the negative returns they predict, okay? And if, if it is, and I'm going to tell you already, spoiler alert, it is biased, a very pessimistically bias, but you, you guess with the title of the paper, then is the bias intentional or not? And that's much more uh, complicated to show, as you can imagine, because it's hard to go into the head of activist short sellers to know whether they do it on purpose or not. And, and probably the, the last and very important question, and we try still working on that, is whether investors, in which investors, in a sense, uh, whether they're harmed, do they suffer from the bias, short sellers bias? Okay, if it's intentional, if it's overly pessimistic, do, for instance, are uh, retail investors hurt by that, by, by that bias? And we try to, to answer to all those questions. Um, so we have a number of contributions in the paper, but that's more a sort of a, an academic slide um, what, that we show to uh, other colleagues. Um, let's go maybe right into the data. Okay, so what type of data do we have in the paper? Well, we, we have, as I said, 637 activist short sellers report with a target price and 600 activist short seller report without. Okay, what's the implied return on average? What is the sort of prediction from activist short seller uh, derived from their target prices? Um, well, the average is minus 65%. So, it's, it's a very important number, right? Because it, it can be worse than minus 100%, right? Um, but I'm sorry, I hear some background noise. Is there a, maybe there's a question? Okay, no, I think someone has his mic or her mic on. It's okay. Um, so it's minus 65%. So you can see that the sort of uh, prediction is very strong, right? They don't write a report just predicting a minus 10% um, a minus 10% uh, return. So another important number maybe to have in mind is that in 14% of the report of the reports with a target price, that target price is zero, zero euro, zero euro, zero US dollars. Okay. So a, a good chunk of an uh, uh, activist short sellers report have a target price of zero. Okay. So the first question we try to, uh, to address is whether these, the, the, the disclosure of the target price lead to a stronger market reaction. And, and, and that's what we find. We find that when there is a, a, a target price disclosed by activist short seller, the reaction is quicker. So the, 
stock returns adjust more rapidly when there is a, a target price disclosed by activist short seller. So you can see in the bold line, you see the sort of average reaction when there is a target price. And in the dotted line, you see the average reaction when there is uh, no target price uh, disclosed. So you see that after a month, so that would be 21 trading days, uh, there's no difference. But the, the, the rapidity of the adjustment is quicker when there is a target price. So wh why, why that is the case? We think it comes from basically two main effects. First is that numbers facilitate data processing. So when you uh, are given information, if I summarize the information into a, a, a a quantitative number that might help you process the information more rapidly. So the signal is easier to act upon, right? It's easier to act uh, on a number than on an argument, a, a qualitative argument, right? So that's the first uh, reason we think that is the case. The second reason we think that is the case is that the media may be likely to disseminate more rapidly uh, salient information. So when you have a clear uh, target price, the information may be very salient. So um, the media might communicate more about it. Uh, the, that slide is, is quite, was quite fascinating for us because that slide shows that if you, in a way, if you rank all the prediction of the activist short seller from the, the less pessimistic, so that would be on the left, to the mo most pessimistic, so that would be on the right, and then you observe the stock return following the dissemination of the activist short seller's report, you see this sort of monotonic distribution. So let me explain. So that means that the sort of price adjustment after activist short sellers report is decreasing as a function of the pessimistic bias. So it, it's, it's sort of a, 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 a nice sort of demonstration that they don't issue target price randomly. So let's say you have a very severe accusation against the firm. So you're implied return that would be, uh, for instance, minus 95%. And so the stock returns after that uh, minus 95% implied return, the, the actual stock return would be very low, would be lower than if you had predicted a minus, say, minus 60% uh, uh, stock return, implied return. Okay, so you do see that the, the prediction, the actual realization of returns is not as bad as the prediction, but it's correlated. Okay, it's correlated except for ex very extreme uh, prediction. So when they predict minus 100% return, and we saw that that was the case in 14% uh, of the activist short sellers report, uh, it's actually, the, the actual return is actually better than if they had predicted minus 95%. Okay, so that's what it means. So different bars come from different return windows. So five, six days, uh, three months, a year, basically. Okay, so that's a sort of a striking uh, pattern of uh, return. Um, so, so that, that answered the first, uh, the first question. The next question is whether, why would they do that? In some cases, well, whereas they don't do it in other cases. Well, they do it, um, it basically depends on three main factors. First, when it's relatively easy to value the firm, if the cost of providing a target price is not so difficult, they will be more likely to disclose the target price. Okay, so that would be the, the that first variable. That's what we try to do to show here. Next, if they expect that by do by by providing a target price that the stock price will adjust more rapidly, then they will be more likely to do so. Okay, so that what's that's what we try to show here. And finally, if they are established firm with a strong reputation, say if you are uh, Citron Research, Muddy Waters Research, uh, an established firm, you've already, uh, to some extent, uh, took down a lot of firms. Basically, your reputation protects you against, I guess, valuation error, and you're more willing to do so. Okay, so your experience, for instance, uh, is positively correlated with the likelihood to issue a, a target price. All right, and that's what we, we show here. Okay, so, so th those results are important if you're trying to assess whether uh, a firm has been attacked by an activist short seller. Is it, there's no target price? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you can sort of have some information about the circumstances with these uh, results. 
So the next thing we try to show is whether they're pessimistic or, uh, or not, if they are basically accurate or pessimistic. So the implied return, so the, pre the average prediction, like we said, is minus 65%, okay? So the question we try to answer with this slide is, do we see on average a minus 65 re return over a uh, different time period after the release of the report? So six days, a month, three months, half a year, a year, okay? And what we do find is that basically, if you take whatever actual uh, return window you take, there's never going to be a such a dramatic decrease, or it's very unlikely to see a, a very, uh, such a dramatic decrease in the stock price. So if you take to the extreme, the lowest point of the attacked firm stock over the next year, uh, the correct prediction happens in 17% of the cases. Uh, and so the bias is basically 58%. So basically they predict minus 65%, but what really happens later is minus seven, minus 8%. That's sort of the, 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 the key takeaway from this slide. Uh, so here you, you see the average uh, bias for all of those activist short sellers. It's, it's uh, just descriptive. Um, and the next interesting question we try to answer, so that would be the, the question number three. I'm, I'm checking if I'm good with the time. I still have 15 minutes, so I'm okay. Uh, we try to show, we try to see whether the bias is intentional or unintentional. So basically, do they do it on purpose? We showed that they are pessimistic, but maybe they are just pessimistic on average about life. You know, maybe they think that uh, everything that happens is bad, uh, they, they are in, always in a bad mood, uh, etc. So we, we don't really know, we can't go into their, uh, their brain. What we can do is to, to see whether over time, they improve their prediction. Because if, if they are really uh, objective, what they would do, uh, they, would, they would issue a target price, they would see that they are not uh, accurate, and then they would issue maybe a less pessimistic target price over time, right? It's called feedback error. That's what you do when you, 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 you overshoot, you overshoot something, you correct your, your aim and you shoot more accurately. But what we do observe is not that at all. What we do observe is a very different behavior. The, 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 pes the pessimistic bias tends to be positively correlated with past campaigns, with past attack. So they issue pessimistic target prices and they keep doing so over time and they become more and more pessimistic over time. So that means two things. That means that it's very likely to be intentional, the fact that they do that. And that also means that it's very likely um, that they think it's a, uh, it's a strategy that works in serving their objective. Their objective is, of course, to uh, decrease the, 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 the stock price and to then to, um, to basically close their position in a few days. So uh, the more rapid the stock price adjustment is, the better that is for them. Uh, the next thing that we try to show, because it's, it's hard to show whether they're intentional or unintentional, so we do it different ways. Uh, another thing that we try to, to, to do is to see whether uh, when, they be, when they are more aggressive in their language, they issue more pessimistic uh, target price. So in a sense, what we try to say here is that uh, we know they, they have the option to be more or less aggressive. They can be neut neutral in their language or let's call it more polite in their language, or they can be very aggressive. They can use swear words, for instance. So what we did is we, we developed a Python code and we coded, manu not manually, but we coded with an algorithm, the number of swear words uh, in, the, in the Activist Short Sellers report. I don't know if you have read some of those Activist Short Sellers, but they can be very, uh, uh, imp let's call it, uh, that's an understatement, impolite, the F word, uh, bad word, B word, uh, S word. You can imagine the type of word they use. Uh, uh, and, and the more they tend to use those words, basically the negative coefficient means that the more they exhibit bias. Okay, so we try to, to, to show that basically they can choose how aggressive they want to be. And if they want to sort of push it, they, it's consistent with uh, intentionality. So that's uh, the first part. The other part that we do in this table is we try to see whether when they try to sort of be objective, they're likely to use words about uh, 
about uh, valuation model. If you try to provide uh, an accurate target price, you're likely to use a comparable DCF, uh, accounting metrics, uh, earnings per share. So those type of uh, words. Um, and when they do that, they exhibit less bias. Okay, so since they can choose also that, we try to, we think it, it sort of support the idea that they are um, intentionally pessimistic. All right. Last question that we try to address in the paper um, is whether that pessimistic bias hurt some investors. And it's hard to sort of answer that question, but we try our best. Um, and we are currently revising the paper to add more uh, evidence of that. So the first thing that we try to show is that, and we discovered, is that when they, are, when they issue a target price, there is a stronger, a more, uh, a stronger likelihood that we will observe a, a reversal of the stock price. So the stock price will decrease first and then will rebound a little bit. Maybe because the target price is so pessimistic that some investors, they panic, they, 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 they adjust their portfolios, they sell a lot of shares, and then uh, the stock price, then other investors realize it's not that bad and the stock price rebounds. So if you were an investor and you sold early in a panic mode, you know, the, the, the good word, if you, the expression, if you panic, panic first. Okay, so some people may have done that. And in that case, they would be wrong to do that because maybe the stock price would decrease first and then rebound. And so here we show that uh, in the zero to five trading days, and then if we, we, we took the lowest price in the zero to five trading days, and, and then we looked at the price in the next year, uh, there's a strong, the, a more likely reversal if the actively short seller issued a target price. Okay, um, and then there, there we try to, to document the, the sort of average return, the difference between the average returns with and without the target price. Okay, all right. So that's the first uh, part. The second part, we we focus on um, active short seller that issue the target price. And this time we try to see whether some investors are hurt when the bias, when the, the pessimistic bias is stronger. And, and what we do, do find is that sort of strangely, when the bias is less severe, um, there is a stronger frequency of reversal. Okay. So uh, that is what we have currently in the paper. And what we're doing right now is we try to separate, so it's not on the slide, we try to separate between retail investors and institutional investors. And we try to see whether retail investors are more likely to be, uh, uh, I would say, fooled by the pessimistic bias of active short seller than other types of investors, such as institutional investors. And what we do find so far, we find evidence of um, the fact that uh, retail investors are more likely to panic and are unlikely to understand the, to go sort of see through the uh, pessimistic bias of active short seller. So if I can conclude, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll basically uh, move to the, uh, the question, the Q&A. Uh, so yes, short sellers are able to identify overvalued firms. So they are informative in the sense that first, uh, they, they identify the overvalued firms. Their target prices are correlated with subsequent returns. Okay. So they exhibit a pessimistic bias, which is sort of interestingly opposite to financial analyst uh, optimistic bias. Uh, but at the same time, they can be manipulative because yes, they do, they do identify overvalued firms, but at the same time, their target prices might be too uh, pessimistic and it's likely to be intentional. Uh, we don't have definitive evidence for the record, but we, we find of some sort, sort of suggestive evidence that it's the case. And, and we also find evidence that investors, some investors at least, tend to overreact to target prices. Uh, okay, so this paper is only about active short sellers, so that's a sort of limitation. We don't talk about all short sellers, we talk only about uh, active short sellers. So thank you very much for uh, this, uh, your attention, and I'm ready to, um, to take questions if there are some questions. Thanks. So, Alex, I don't know how you want to do this, or should I? Sure. So, there, 
so there were a couple questions uh, in the chat while you uh, began the presentation. Um, I don't know if you want to react on those directly. Um, yes. If, okay. Okay. Um, so Nathalie, hi Nathalie. Um, isn't it front running or are they proprietary trader with no client? So they are, <laughs> good to see you. They are, uh, they are proprietary traders, so they are hedge fund. Um, and they accumulate evidence information based on publicly available information. Okay, so things they might do, for instance, if a particular, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's, a Chinese firm, for instance, located somewhere in, uh, in China, uh, they think that the firm has no operation, no real operation in China. What they will do, they will send a, a private investigator, count the number of trucks going into a, a warehouse or something like that to, to sort of, and then they will report that. They will say, okay, we, we've been, we've checked all of the addresses of the firm, nothing exists. That's something that we've read in some reports. Okay. So they, they rely on public information and they trade on their own account or they use, like I, I said that, I try to, to explain that, but it's, it's a bit complex, or they use a balance sheet partners. So they use another hedge fund with more money. And the, the other hedge fund is going to stay in the back and just uh, rely on the information. Uh, so Chadi El Amato, by disseminating a rationale for shorting, does that not qualify as a form of market manipulation? So that's a legal question. Uh, to which I don't really have a, a precise answer. I can give you my answer as, a, as an analyst, as a CFA analyst um, and a professor, I guess. But um, I guess you are, at least in the US, in the context of US, you are entitled to your opinions and you can express opinions uh, as, a, as a citizen, I guess, uh, about whether some stocks are overvalued or not. Okay. Um, then the question is, uh, is a bit more complex if you want, but there are some legal cases where they were, you know, attacked by clients and, and sued. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the, the paper doesn't speak really to that. So Nathalie, uh, I agree too, it's pretty, they are well known to be historical success. Yes, so they, they, could, they can be, that's why it's a very interesting topic because it's, it's some, to some extent, we don't know whether it's market manipulation or not. It's, it's, it's sort of complex. What I can tell you is that uh, some of those activist short sellers has been, have been, have been um, uh, fined by some market authorities. I believe Citron Research was in Hong Kong. Uh, don't quote, quote me on that, but I think that was the case. But you know, in a bunch of most, the most common cases is that uh, they, they, are, they are not uh, condemned by any authority. So, and in, in most cases, to some extent, they, they tend to be sort of correct in their, in their prediction, in their, their accusation, at least. Uh, Alexandre, yes, you will have the PowerPoint. Absolutely. Gabriel, what? Do the short seller take in account or integrate non-financial feature when running the research, the valorization, when they get the price target? So, uh, so it depends what you mean by non-financial features, but one thing is for sure that some of them are very have very large resources and a lot of staff to sort of investigate on the, on the firm. So they will have an army of private investigators. They will have a lot of analysts. They will rely on all, uh, in some cases you, you have also during conference call with analysts, they, uh, they have former CIA agent trying to assess whether in the language of the top management, there is some signs that they are lying. Okay, so you, we've seen that also in, in some of the reports that there's also sort of forensic investigation with a former uh, agent of uh, intelligence. So it can be very sophisticated. So they use everything that they can to sort of make their point. Uh, Boris Dave, how do you define pessimistic? Isn't it a function of the extreme overvaluation? So um, that's a good question. How, how, we, how do we know whether it's a bias or not a bias or pessimistic or, or not pessimistic. Well, the definition is fairly simple. We look at the uh, implied return uh, that they, 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 they issue, okay? And we look at the actual returns and we make the difference between the two, okay? So if you think that the return is going to uh, drop, uh, the stock is going to drop by 80% and it drops only by 10%, 
then we claim that you have a bias of 70%, okay? And we, we measure it at different time windows, around different time horizons, okay? So that's, I mean, that's one, uh, I would say, practical definition of uh, pessimistic. Hello, Philippe. Philippe Mopa, uh, good, to, good to read you. Please note that Martin Shkreli, who was mentioned in the previous slide, is in jail. <laughs> Not all activist short sellers are angel. Duly noted, it, he was, uh, I think he was called at some point, the most hated man, uh, hated man of America. And, and no, and no, we, I mean, certainly we're not trying to say that they are all angels. We, of course, it's a very complex situation. Some, what we say in the paper and what we say in academic research in general, we talk about averages, right? We talk at, about on average, this is what, what we find, what, we, what happens. So what I'm saying is basically that on average, they're informative. On average, they issue uh, uh, target prices, negative research report that on average turns out to be correct. Okay, turn out to be correct. And we're not certainly not saying that that's the case every single time and across every single activity short sellers. But that's, that's what, we, what we find. That's what the literature has found also. Uh, so the short sellers you study are usually not investment management firms. Oh, are they regulated? So I believe they're regulated as uh, the same as hedge fund. So, which is not a, a lot of regulation, at my understanding. Um, but, uh, but yes, so, the, so the, the answer is the same as hedge fund. Um, so Bernard, if you keep in mind that during the la la latest months, five market regulators at Nesma decided to prohibit short selling on some stocks like banks, how, you, how, how does your paper should modify their views about the behavior of short sellers? It's, it like, <laughs> it's a difficult question, Bernard, with a lot of implication. Uh, thank you. Um, so I believe um, our paper is really about activist short sellers. Um, what I can tell you is that from the literature, from the academic research that has been done on the global financial crisis, the main takeaway from that literature about short sellers in general was, was that it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, improving financial market or increasing market efficiency of banning short selling. Okay? Regarding the current market environment, I don't know whether they should change their approach. Uh, of course, the, the sort of uh, worry about shorting banks is that banks are systemic. So uh, if they are not doing well, then the overall economy is not doing well. And considering the current situation, we don't clearly don't clearly want that. Um, I guess the, the main takeaway of the paper for uh, market authority would be the last part that we try, we're still working on about whether all investors are sophisticated enough to sort of see through the intentional bias of activist short sellers. Okay. So our evidence that I haven't presented that, but will be included in the paper uh, soon is that some retail investors might panic a bit too much and a bit too, not a, they don't trade efficiently necessarily on that information. And so that, that some other investors take advantage of, of that. Thanks, Luke. So do we have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand and ask your question directly or write them in the chat. We still have quite a bit of time. No questions, seems to be a bit of a shy, a shy crowd. No problem. So we have another question in the chat right now from uh, Natalie. Uh, who mentions retail investors usually have worse returns, net of fees, especially if they trade a lot. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true, uh, true on average. Uh, and in that case, um, in that case, what we found is that they, they sort of, um, when there is a very pessimistic target price, what they, they, they won't necessarily trade very rapidly on the information. So they don't sort of, adjust the, the, their portfolio fast enough, and then they continue trading on the information, on the pessimistic information for too long. So that's what we found in the uh, new test that we've run 
on, on, the, on the data. That basically, let's say, the price has adjusted after five or six days. Um, and and they, that's when they start trading because maybe they were slow to get the information. Maybe they, they still, they take the pessimistic target price at face value without realizing that it's very uh, biased, etc. So, um, uh, Philip asks, why is there so few short sellers in France? So I have no idea about the statistics about, uh, about short sellers in France, but I guess sort of my impression is that in continental Europe, you know, I mean, short sellers have a bad reputation everywhere, but maybe that's especially true in continental Europe where, where they're actually uh, perceived as uh, uh, worse than everywhere, than especially in the US. So I don't know whether in France that would be possible to have a, an activist short seller invited on a French uh, finance TV, for instance. I, I think that would be uh, uh, that would be that would be strange. Um, so, so Philippe, you mentioned that there are zero activist short sellers in France. I can tell you one. I, Iceberg Research is an activist short seller. He's French. Um, his name is, uh, is it's uh, public now, so I can tell his name. His name is uh, Arnaud Wagner. He's an activist short seller. He's the one that uh, I, I believe he, he attacked a couple of firms, uh, Nobel Group in 2013, I believe, and uh, as well as other firms. He was quite successful in identifying those firms. Um, I don't know whether he lives in France, uh, but he's French, certainly. He did part of his career in, uh, in Asia. And, uh, and he is also a nice guy. Oh, I didn't see uh, the question from Alejandro. What do you think about the impact of low interest rate on short selling and about the road forward for short selling? Um, those are, are very open questions and I, I don't really know how to answer them, to be honest. Uh, I guess, I, first, but to answer the first part of your question, I guess, I don't know to what extent uh, interest rate influence the borrowing cost of the shares that uh, short sellers uh, are using. I, I, I haven't read any paper on that. Maybe that's, uh, that's an interesting question anyway, to, to, to see whether it's really, it really depends on that uh, element. What I know is that most of those targets, they are simply traded. They have a very low amount of free float. So it's not that easy to short them anyway, because you need the borrowing costs are quite high. That's that that I know for sure. Um, and the road forward for short selling, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I guess maybe more regulation. I think the current situation regarding activist short selling uh, is uh, we don't know what's uh, what's allowed, what's not allowed. We 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 saw that with the uh, um, cases of activist short sellers uh, attacking French firms. Uh, in the end, I'm not even sure whether you know, what are the accepted type of disclosure that can be made? What are the things that are clearly uh, going too far? So we'll see, um, but I believe that that's a, a sort of regulatory agenda that, that's going to, to happen. Any other questions? Feel There's free one. to take the mic. Ah, just run, went right now from Gabriel, so go ahead. So European regulators promote a long-term view for investment in order to integrate stakeholders and ESG risk factor. How will short sellers handle this regulation bias? Uh, you guys ask uh, difficult questions. <laughs> um, I am I'm a bit unsure. Uh, for sure, one thing's for sure is that uh, opaque disclosure or opaque corporate disclosure and poor governance are typically factors that attract short sellers. Okay. If you have a firm with a sort of stellar uh, share, price, uh, uh, share price returns, so you've been growing and growing, but you have uh, opaque disclosure, you have poor corporate governments, governance, you're very likely to be targeted by, by short sellers or activist short sellers. Uh, because they, they, those guys, they ask, uh, tough question and they're the one to some extent, you know, the extent of due diligence in financial markets. I mean, it's done partly by financial analysts. It's, it's done by different types of investors, but also by activist short sellers. 
And I believe to some extent that they, they are sort of uh, good at that. Now, sometimes they exaggerate, but on average, again, on average, they are good at identifying some risk uh, factors and they could uh, start targeting firms on environmental grounds or things like that. Uh, what is my view about short selling of Tesla slug? No idea. No idea. I'm uh, like you, I have no, no clue whether it's, a, it's going too far or not. Uh, I know that Citron Research shorted, I mean, Citron Research and Tesla, it's a very long story. Uh, the, the stock was shorted, then it was bullish, bearish, bullish, bearish. He's done back and forth like that for a while. So uh, clearly, I haven't uh, done my due diligence uh, on Tesla. Hi, sorry, uh, a question. Do you think that in cryptocurrencies it could happen the same, and in particular uh, the sell-off of Bitcoin of a few years ago from 15K? I'm sorry, I didn't, I heard that you're talking about cryptocurrencies? Yes, if you think that uh, a similar effect could apply to cryptocurrencies. So that's a good question. Can you short a crypto asset or cryptocurrencies? I, I don't uh, know. Maybe some platform do artificial uh, trading, I mean, on this. But, but that's, a, that's a potential way to, to sort of uh, diversify uh, uh, short selling, right? If you, can, if you have more asset classes that you can sort of target as a short seller, that's uh, certainly uh, at least the, the, the sort of the, the returns profile uh, would justify actively short seller in being interested in uh, crypto assets. Alejandro, you had a question about whether we saw an evolution of short selling reports when compared to old reports. It seems that reports are more aggressive now than in the past. So we've not actually investigated that question, but one thing that we realized is that activist short sellers, they have their own style of uh, writing a report. So for instance, Citron research is more about the business model. It will, like the video I showed you, is it's very likely to attack you on the business model uh, rather than saying that you are a fraud. So they have a style. And, and then what I think happens, it, for, for instance, for sure, the disclosure of target price, I think it has increased in uh, frequency over the year. So I think that the, the, the sort of the industry has established a sort of stylized approach uh, of attacking a firm, sort of uh, a book of how you can take down the film. Uh, so that there, there are some remarks about shorting synthetically crypto assets. Uh, clearly, maybe, maybe that's the case. Um, so do they use derivatives to build short position? Well, we don't really know what they do. I mean, sometimes they say they have, like I said, a balance sheet partners, okay? Uh, they may use options strategy to do this. Uh, and that's not something that is disclosed by those. Those are, and that was, there was a question earlier that uh, what are their regulation? They, they're basically not a lot of regulation. So they are very, uh, they claim the firm they attack are very opaque. They are also very opaque, right? We, sometimes we don't even know the name of the guy that's running the hedge fund, okay? Uh, but at the same time, they don't uh, issue shares to the public, but um, so we don't know how, what are the exact trading strategy, how long they have their position. Uh, we, all we know is some sort of uh, uh, anecdotal evidence about what they do. Um, okay. So do I think that this kind of regulation will reduce the playing field of short seller in the future? Uh, I have Gabriel, I'm sorry, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly what will be the, uh, the regulatory development, but we'll see, probably we'll see some changes um, about those, uh, that, that it's a sort of recent market. It's basically 10, 10 years old only. So we'll see how, how, how it evolves. So thank you, Luke. So unfortunately, we're running a bit out of time. Um, a lot of questions tonight. Um, so Bernard, if you'd like to uh, conclude. Yes, thank you, Marie-Alix. Uh, well, uh, Luke, it was a pleasure to hear you about this very sensitive subject. And as you understood, uh, the subject provoked a lot of questions from cryptocurrencies to retail investors and a lot of questions about uh, maybe what could be the future for 
short sellers. Um, I imagine that um, in the future, your study will continue to, to be developed in this field. And I understood that short sellers are as informative and at the same time manipulative as you explained in your presentation. I hope that uh, you will continue to uh, explain us this subject in the future, mainly by explaining how the player are adding value and liquidity in the market. So thank you, um, Luc, for this uh, very interesting um, presentation. As usual, I would like to mention that the replay will be available, plus an access, plus the fact that the PowerPoint will be available. And Maria Lix will post two links plus um, the post event survey uh, when it will be possible. Thank you a lot of you. Uh, thank you all of you, and I hope that you enjoyed this event. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, see you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.